Um. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, another episode of Panel Seminar. Um, today we have a very special guest. Uh, we have uh, uh, Vitaly Feldman, uh, who is from Apple AI Research. So uh, this ACL, there was some discussion about Vitaly's uh, work uh, in one of the talk I attended. Um, so I invited Vitaly and he's kind enough to uh, give a talk at another seminar today. So uh, let me quickly uh, read the bio. Uh, Vitaly Feldman is a research scientist at AI Research, working on foundations of machine learning and privacy preserving data analysis. His recent uh, research interests include tools for analysis of generalization, distributed privacy-preserving learning, privacy-preserving optimization, and adaptive data analysis. Vitaly holds a PhD from Harvard and was previously a research scientist at Google Research and IBM Research. Uh, his work was recognized by the Conference on Learning Theory Best Student Paper Award in 2005 and 2013 and by IBM Research Best Paper Award in 2014, 15, and 16. His, research, uh, his recent, research, recent research on foundations of adaptive data analysis has been featured in uh, CACM Research Highlights, Finds, and uh, Research Blogs of IBM, Google, and Microsoft. He served as a program co-chair for uh, Conference on Learning Theory 2016 and Algorithmic Learning Theory Conference 20, 2021, and as a co-organizer of uh, Simon's Institute program on data privacy in 2019. So let's welcome Vitaly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation and the kind introduction, TG. It's uh, a great pleasure to give a talk uh, at your seminar. Of course, I wish I could do it in person, but I guess that's uh, uh, life uh, these days. Um, I am going to talk about the role of memorization in machine learning. Uh, I'll be focusing primarily on image classification since uh, much of this work has been inspired uh, by results that have been observed in this context. And also I'm somewhat more familiar with the result in, in this area, but the ideas uh, apply to machine learning in the context of uh, NLP and machine learning more broadly. So I hope uh, you, you'll find uh, those interesting. Uh, and of course, feel free to uh, ask questions if things don't make as much sense. Uh, I hope you'll find some way to interrupt uh, and ask the questions. Uh, the talk is based on two papers, one of which is joint uh, work with Chuan Zhang, uh, who is my uh, great colleague um, at uh, Google Research. Um, before going to, uh, to the talk, I, I would like to uh, say that, uh, that I would like to dedicate this uh, uh, talk to the memory of uh, Ilya Einstein. Uh, Ilya Einstein uh, was uh, my friend, uh, a close friend, and uh, an extraordinary person. And he passed uh, away unexpectedly just last week. Uh, he uh, holds a PhD from USC. He graduated from computer science department in 2007. Uh, and uh, I know that USC had a special place uh, in his heart. So it gives me even uh, more honor and pleasure to. Uh, to commemorate him uh, in this talk. All right. Um, so the starting point uh, of this work is the well-known observation that uh, deep learning algorithms tend to fit the training data very well, even when the test error is quite high. Of course, at this point, we got used to this behavior of deep learning algorithms, but it was very surprising to me when I first learned about it. Uh, and the reason this is surprising is that if you think about it, the only way for a learning algorithm to fit training data so well, even, even when true accuracy is relatively low, is to effectively memorize a large fraction of the training labels. This uh, seems to contradict the standard intuition uh, that many of us have about learning, since we think of learning as carefully balancing some notion of capacity and fit uh, to training data so as to avoid overfitting. Of course, now we have much better empirical evidence and understanding of, uh, uh, of this kind of memorization behavior. Uh, in the experiments that are now famous, uh, my collaborator Chuang and his colleagues showed the standard deep learning algorithms fit well, even completely randomly labeled data sets. For example, standard training algorithms fit over 90% of the completely randomly 
uh, labeled ImageNet dataset, which has over a million uh, examples. Uh, Jean and colleagues also pointed out that this behavior is not well explained by existing theoretical analysis of generalization. And the goal of this work is to provide uh, an explanation to this uh, phenomenon. Uh, but before we can hope to explain something, let me uh, define it somewhat more formally. Specifically, I would like to formalize memorization of, uh, uh, of the training labels. And uh, uh, I'll do this uh, using the following definition, which intuitively says that the label of a training example is memorized by a learning algorithm if the learning algorithm cannot predict that label, uh, label based on the rest of the uh, data set, but it still fits the label. So it's not cannot predict, but still fits. Formally, uh, and as you can see in this definition, for a data set S that consists of n labeled example, an index i of an example in the data set, and a learning algorithm A, we measure the memorization of the i-th example as the difference between two terms. Uh, the first term measures how well the algorithm fits the i-th example, how well it actually, uh, how well it agrees on uh, with that example in the training data. And the probability is necessary because most learning algorithms are randomized. And the second term uh, measures how well the learning algorithms predict the, the label of that same i-th example when the example is removed from the data set, when we train without that specific training example. In other words, how hard it is to predict the label without observing it. Informally, we'll say that an example is memorized if it's this memorization value that we have defined is relatively large, for example, larger than some fixed positive constant. So the accuracy improves by, and prediction improves by something like 50% or something like this. Uh, this definition also has a nice property that it can be directly related to so-called generalization gap, which is the difference between the training and test error. Uh, specifically for any distribution P over labeled examples and a data set S drawn ID from this distribution, the expectation of the average generalization value for all the examples is basically equal to the expected generalization gap. So it's just, um, so basically what we're saying is that all algorithms for which the generalization gap is large effectively have to memorize a significant fraction of uh, labels according to this definition. And we know that typically generalization gaps are very large for deep learning algorithms. Typically the training and test error are very different. So they must be uh, memorizing uh, a large fraction of the labels. And the question we are addressing in this work uh, is whether memorization and the resulting large generalization gap are fundamental aspects of learning in the sense that they are necessary for achieving optimal accuracy. And the alternative is uh, that it is some sort of side effect of the learning algorithms that we're using in the process of learning. Uh, so in addition to this being a fundamental question about machine learning, there are also practical reasons to understand it. Um, and those come from the area of uh, private data analysis that I'm uh, also working on. Uh, specifically, if you train your model on sensitive data about people, for example, their health records or financial records, and the model, and the model memorizes the labels of the data, publishing the model can pose privacy risks. And these are not purely theoretical concerns. Uh, there is now a fairly long line of research uh, with successful black box membership inference attacks on standard learning algorithms. And in these attacks, the attacker figures out whether a certain point is present in the data set by looking at the predictions of the model on various points. And perhaps more troublingly, a recent work of Carlini and others uh, gives a very striking demonstration that uh, that uh, one can actually extract sensitive training data from uh, large uh, language models, which again shows that um, um, uh, deep learning algorithms are memorizing a lot about training data, which is of course very problematic for data privacy. Um, so both of these attacks can be a privacy risk in some contexts where data is sensitive, and therefore it is natural to ask whether label memorization or memorization more broadly can be avoided without sacrificing uh, accuracy of learning. So uh, now let me briefly go over some of the standard approaches to understanding of generalization uh, and explain why uh, they do not uh, 
uh, yeah, uh, why they are somewhat inconsistent with the phenomenon that we're trying to discuss. So the study approach uh, is, uh, to generalization is based on expressing the generalization error as the uh, sum of two errors. The first uh, uh, is part is the empirical error, uh, uh, which is this uh, the first term here. And the second uh, uh, term is just the difference between the generalization error, the, the one we want to minimize, and the empirical error, which, which is referred to as generalization gap. So of course, we can measure the empirical error. That's easy. And uh, the second term is typically controlled or understood uh, through some kind of notion of complexity or capacity of the learning algorithms. The most well-known ones are VC dimension, margins, uh, norms. Uh, uh, people also use uh, stability and other ways to control specifically this generalization gap or some notion. Uh, of can I ask a, a yes. question here? Yes, please. Sorry. So the first term and third term look like they're the same, yes. right? This, this is a, an extremely simple decomposition. We're just saying empirical error. Uh, oh, so the generalization yes. error is, is the empirical yeah. error plus the difference between the empirical. We want to know the generalization, but we just split it into two parts, the empirical part and the difference between the generalization yes. and the empirical part. Gotcha. Okay. This, yeah, it's all, uh, this part is, is the, the sort of the interesting part starts in this, in the, in, in how we control that um, gap, generalization gap. And uh, sort of, once you do, uh, once this decomposition is done, uh, the sort of this analysis suggests that the optimal algorithm, the ideal algorithm, uh, learning algorithm, should be effectively minimizing over some space of models the sum of the empirical error and this this proxy, uh, some proxy for the generation gap again, which is obtained um, uh, using these notions of capacity and so on and so forth, and. Uh, while it's it's not hard to show it uh, more um, formally, but intuitively, it's not hard to see that for every label that is memorized, the algorithm needs to increase the complexity of the model because uh, again, memorization requires uh, increasing the complexity or capacity of the model. And in the worst case, the memorized label can be incorrect. It could be some kind of noise or outlier. Uh, so in the worst case, the memorization is not useful, uh, is, is not helpful. And in fact, uh, these typically the, uh, in all proxies that at least I'm aware of and that are used in theory, the memorization of a single label uh, requires increasing the value of this proxy, that our bound on this uh, gap by a value which is much larger than the gain in the, that one we gain in the empirical or uh, error by memorizing one example. So the resulting theoretical analysis effectively suggest that we should not be memorizing. Uh, and in that way, it kind of contradicts practice because in practice, we see algorithms that do memorize uh, 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 training labels. And of course, I should mention that at this point, this, so this is the, the, the issue uh, in a nutshell with the classical approach to understanding of generalization. But of course, at this point, the classical approach is not the only tool. And many people have been trying to understand this phenomenon. Uh, and let me uh, very brief, briefly mention a few of those uh, works just for uh, for a context. So uh, one uh, line of work, which I think is worth mentioning, is understanding of the generalization properties of in interpolating methods. An interpolating algorithm is an algorithm that fits all the training labels uh, perfectly. Uh, such algorithms have been studied since the classical work of Cover and Hart on, on the one nearest neighbor, which is sort of the, the, maybe the, the, the classical um, uh, uh, interpolating algorithm. But there has been a lot of work and interest in this uh, topic in, in recent couple of years. At a high level, were, uh, these uh, works show that interpolation can be harmless or benign, specifically in certain uh, problem settings, interpolation algorithm I achieve asymptotically the same generalization guarantees as the best non-interpolating algorithms. Um, so uh, these works show that it is possible to generalize while interpolating, but they still do not explain why interpolation is uh, so common in the first place. And let me also point that label memorization also happens without interpolation. For example, the ImageNet experiments that I mentioned uh, the training error was 9%, so it wasn't zero. But still, we know that, again, these uh, uh, examples are randomly labeled, and 90% of, the, of them are fit. So there is still a lot of memorization. 
Another related uh, concept that people have looked at uh, and is sometimes uh, often mentioned in this context is over parameterization, basically having more parameters than data points uh, in your model. Uh, the, typically, label memorization and, uh, and interpolation require all parameterization because otherwise we won't be able to, to memorize and, and fit all the data. And there are many works showing that over-parameterization over is a useful tool. It's very good to over-parameterize. For example, it makes easier to optimize, and it also allows the learning algorithm to search in a richer space of models. However, just because an algorithm can fit all the data does not mean it should, that it's statistically the optimal thing to do. Uh, so benefits of over-parameterization do not explain memorization and interpolation, just to be clear. Uh, so uh, I hope that gives you a bit of a background on the question we want to answer. And at high level, the answer that uh, we give in this work uh, is that label memorization is actually a fundamental aspect of learning from natural da data distribution, specifically distributions that are long tail. In other words, we show that memorization is necessary for achieving clo close to optimal generalization. And I'll describe in uh, the sort of two aspects to it, the one the sort of the theoretical models, which I think is important for, for understanding what's going on. I also uh, describe some empirical evidence that we have. But before going there, let me start with, start with a bit of intuition um, of what uh, is going on. And maybe it will be uh, uh, more useful even than the uh, theory and uh, experiments. So uh, let's uh, look at the, uh, look at these uh, four actual examples of the truck class from the CIFAR 10 training uh, data set. Uh, what's special about uh, these examples is, is that none of these examples would be classified as a truck if, uh, if you were to remove them from the data set. So as we discussed, a learning algorithm would need to memorize their labels to uh, fit them. So an algorithm which fits those labels has to memorize those. And the question whether uh, whether these examples are worth memorizing, should they be memorized or not, and or, or can can memorization be avoided? And just by looking at these examples, I imagine that the answer is not obvious to you. Uh, but using the tools that I'll describe later, we were uh, able to measure usefulness of training examples, and I'll describe what that means later. And it turns out that memorizing the first example is useful. In the following sense, if we were to remove this example, that would significantly decrease the accuracy when classifying this example on the right from the test set. So if you remove that training example, you will suffer this loss on, uh, in accuracy on this test set example. Maybe it's not a huge surprise for you, but the uh, uh, second example does not improve accuracy on trucks in any way, so it's effectively useless. Uh, the third example is actually useful in the same way it helps improve accuracy on the on, on example on the right from the test set. And the fourth example is also uh, useless, doesn't help, uh, at least on the test set uh, uh, for trucks. Uh, so we see that as a whole, memorization of these four examples uh, was useful. Two of the examples were useful. But what is even more interesting is that without access to fresh samples from the distribution, it might be impossible to tell which of those examples will turn out to be useful. Uh, basically, they're all very different. Uh, all examples, uh, all, uh, they're all very different from other examples uh, of the track that are available to the learning algorithm. So in a way, in order to get the benefit of memorizing the useful examples, uh, the first and the third, the learning algorithm also needs to memorize the useless ones. Uh, and this is exactly why the resulting models end up having such a large generalization gap. They memorize a lot of useless example just to make sure they don't miss out and get the benefits from the useful ones. Uh, this is also in a nutshell, the reason why our theories uh, of generalization do not explain this effect of memorization. They're based on bounds that estimate the worst case result of memorization. And in the worst case, memorization is useless. Uh, let me now um, tell you where I think these hard and atypical 
examples come from and sort of what is uh, uh, yeah what is their uh, role uh, in learning uh, as a whole. And uh, for this, my main sort of point and observation is that natural data distributions are not homogeneous, like our favorite Gaussian distribution. They're better thought of uh, as consisting of numerous subpopulations or clusters that are quite different from each other. Um, for example, let's look at the uh, some some images of the uh, class of birds again from the CIFAR 10 data set. Uh, and as you can see, these uh, in, uh, these images uh, contain images of hundreds of different bird species taken from a variety of angles at different magnification levels and backgrounds. Uh, these subpopulations, of these different types of uh, birds are quite different from each other. Uh, so a learning algorithm that uh, only has seen, say, 5,000 examples of birds may be unable to accurately classify a subpopulation, uh, a distinct subpopulation, without any observing any representative from uh, that subpopulation. Uh, there are many subpopulations, and so in a data set that is not so huge, there will be examples that are unique representative of their subpopulation. Uh, such unique representatives can be coming from a subpopulation that has uh, frequency, which is roughly one over n, and being sort of the, the entire size of the data set. Uh, and predicting accurately on such a population is useful for improving the accuracy. Okay, if something has frequency on the order of one over n, it's kind of useful in the overall uh, in the overall accuracy. At the same time, such unique representatives can be coming from an extremely rare or outlier subpopulations which is not useful for improving accuracy. So these unique examples can be both types, could be kind of uh, infrequent but useful or extremely rare and effectively useless. So for a subpopulation with just one representative, it might be impossible to tell whether subpopulation is useful or not. There's only one representative that we have observed. In addition, when you only have a single representative from some distinct subpopulation, it may be impossible for the algorithm to distinguish a correct label from a noisy one, just because there isn't enough confidence to tell uh, what is the correct label. Uh, so the sort of the main, uh, the, the question we would need to understand uh, is whether these low frequency subpopulations that uh, in the data set are important for achieving high accuracy, or perhaps they are basically too rare and can be ignored. And the answer to this uh, clearly depends uh, on the distribution of frequency of the, of the subpopulation. How, how, how many of these low frequencies of populations are there in the, in the entire dis, uh, data distribution? Um, and informally, it is well known to many practitioners, both working on NLP problems and images, that uh, natural data is basically uh, so-called long tail. And here, long tail specifically refers that that, that things which are rare or very infrequent make up a significant fraction of the data distribution. There is also, in addition to sort of this kind of uh, empirical knowledge, there is also several works that, that kind of try to measure uh, how much of uh, these long tail behaviors that we mentioned, just one of those. Uh, for example, the work of uh, Zhu and others use additional annotations available in the SUN vision data set to plot the number of examples for every visibility pattern of the classified object. So they have annotations for visibility patterns, and they look at how many uh, for each of those annotations they have. Uh, and uh, in the, this top right corner on both of these plots, uh, they plot the number of examples as a function of the frequency rank uh, of, that, of the examples in that, with that annotation on the log log scale. So as you can see, there are some examples there. Here is like the most typical way to represent the bus is from this uh, um, uh, visibility. That's how it's presented. But this is kind of a medium frequency uh, way to the bus is presented. And these are some rare ways in which um, images of a bus are presented. And similarly for the images of a person. And as you can see, if you look at this plot uh, on the log log scales, uh, the it's pretty close to being linear with the slope being uh, minus one. And 
uh, the minus one slope is uh, uh, slope is exactly corresponds to the uh, zip distribution, which is the prototypical long tail distribution, famously followed by words in several languages and observed in many many other uh, uh, contexts. And in this di distribution, the frequency of the kth most frequent uh, item is proportional to one over k. Uh, now, if the number, if the total number of subpopulations uh, uh, t is larger than uh, than n or comparable to n, then the fraction of the data distribution made up by subpopulation with frequencies on the order of one over n is roughly one over log t, uh, which again, as t is not too large, is is very significant. In other words, the total fraction of subpopulation on the order of one over n, the ones which which we really care about in this case, uh, is significant and important for achieving, uh, uh, and particularly it's important for achieving high accuracy when learning. Hope things make sense so far. So um, that's that's all that I wanted to say about the intuition. Uh, so, so, so just to ask you, th this makes total sense to me when we're talking language, uh, mm -hmm. but I just want to be clear about uh, images. So uh, in order to get the bus uh, and person statistics, is there some category, some labeling of like facing front or like woman yes. or and yes. and and how large is this vocabulary and how was this data uh, gathered? This annotation is this all manual? Ah, uh, uh, yes, it's manual annotation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's just additional manual annotations on uh, images which are also annotated for for each class. In addition, they say, oh. This is this type of visibility pattern. This is they were just split into various visibility patterns. Uh, so it's like a hierarchical labeling. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's it's I would say just additional annotations. But in addition, um, uh, because it's it, it, there is a hierarchical la labeling is also actually closely related to this phenomena. So when we do have hierarchical labeling. We typically observe, uh, in, for example, for text and for images, we also typically observe uh, these kind of long tail behaviors. We don't, uh, yeah, especially if then, like, for example, labeling with different animals uh, uh, or different uh, other sub. When, yeah, when hierarchy, uh, hierarchy, you typically observe uh, a very similar be behavior, especially in, in uh, these kind of extreme multi class uh, problems when you have a really huge number of classes. Got it. Thanks. You sort of don't obviously observe it in when in these kind of classical data sets like ImageNet and CIFAR because those are class balanced and there's a small number of class, relatively small number of classes. But yeah, for extreme multi class, uh, you do observe, we'd also observe this behavior. All right, let me uh, say a little bit about theory. Uh, again, I'm a sort of a trained theoretician. I do think it's useful to. To kind of have a sense of uh, why uh, these things uh, are true, also theoretically, or how one can adjust uh, our sort of thinking about uh, modeling of, uh, of of machine learning, uh, so as to capture these phenomena. Uh, if you are not uh, uh, a theoretician uh, uh, or not particularly interested in theory, you can. Uh, Take a quick nap, and we'll come back to uh, experiments uh, a bit later. Let me just say a little bit about theory. So uh, it uh, is based on a model, a very simple basic model uh, that uh, sort of aims to capture this phenomena. We have a sort of a more general model, but but really the the uh, crux of the phenomena can be captured uh, using a very simple theoretical model. And and in this model, we'll have a discrete domain uh, x of size t you can think of each domain element being a word or uh, could be um, in general it will represent some kind of subpopulation of uh, of certain type uh, uh, and we'll describe a learning problem using a meta distribution phi over distribution over data so it'll be a distribution over distributions over data the goal of the learning algorithm will be to minimize the expected generalization error of the model it outputs, where the expectation is with respect to the random choices of 
the data distribution from this met meta distribution phi. And also the, all these standard choices, okay, the, the data set will be drawn IID uh, from uh, the data distribution. And also the, the model will be generated by the algorithm, which itself is randomized. And again, we'll be minimizing the uh, uh, standard uh, uh, prediction error. So far, nothing particularly special. We're just looking at the expected generation error instead of the worst case uh, over a data distribution, which is maybe more common in, in standard models. The main new element of our model is that instead of assuming that nothing is known about the data distribution, we'll assume that frequencies of the elements uh, in our domain have a certain shape. And for now, it will be just general shape. We just know that we will assume that we know something about it. Uh, in other words, we'll assume that uh, there is some prior distribution pi over frequencies of uh, elements in the domain. Uh, uh, and basically, uh, we know the shape of this prior distribution. But before we observe, uh, but we don't know anything about the frequencies of specific words a priori. So the only information about the frequency of each word comes from uh, from what uh, from the number of times we observe it empirically. Uh, so yeah, the only information about the true frequency comes from the number of times it is observed in the data set. To express this, we'll define the following way to generate a distribution over the domain, how, how to capture this specific assumption. Basically for every domain X, uh, for every element in our, sorry, in our X in our domain, we'll pick its frequency randomly and independently from the, this prior distribution over frequency. And that's because we want to make sure that the data distribution is a distribution, we'll ju just normalize uh, these weights uh, to one. And in addition to in this simple setting, we'll assume that there is some distribution uh, capital F over labeling functions. Uh, and here we could also use the, the sort of the worst case choice again as in a standard model but it's more convenient to just assume that there's some distribution over labeling functions um, uh, so overall the sort of the learning problem has the following structure uh, for some prior over uh, frequencies pi and prior over labeling function uh, f will pick a marginal distribution uh, over points d according to the process that i have described where we pick each frequency randomly and independently and uh, normalize. And then we pick randomly the labeling function that defines the distribution, kind of a data distribution. And then the rest is uh, as before. We'll, uh, we are, uh, once we have picked the data distribution, uh, we uh, yeah, pick a data set randomly from that distribution uh, and generate the model. Hope that uh, makes sense. Uh, and for this model, for this type of way to, to model the learning process, or, or the goal of the learning uh, problem will show the following result, the following uh, formal theorem. Uh, we show that effectively that any algorithm that does not fit the examples that appear once in the data set will be suboptimal. So basically that you, the algorithm has to, to achieve close to optimal accuracy, needs to fit all the example it has observed. Uh, specifically, the special case of the theorem we prove the following: uh, for every algorithm, its expected generation error, which is the term on the left, this is the thing we want to man minimize, is at least it's uh, it's equal at least the optimal, the best it could possibly be over all algorithms, uh, uh, plus the term uh, that. Uh, measures the expected number of examples that appear once in the data set, but the model output uh, by the algorithm does not fit. So whenever uh, the algorithm does not fit the uh, the error, it becomes uh, that does not fit one of the training examples. It becomes suboptimal. For it pays this price where uh, the expectation here uh, is exactly this over exactly the same uh, choices of the model and. Uh, the data set and, and yeah and the algorithm's randomness so there is a cost factor tau so for every example that is not fit there is some price which is measured by this uh, factor tau um, and in general this uh, 
this is the general expression uh, for tau. It's not so important that uh, how it looks, but most what's important about it is fully determined by the number of examples that we have and and the prior distribution. And uh, sort of a relatively simple analysis of this term uh, uh, tau shows that uh, the its value is essentially determined by the total weight uh, that the frequencies on the order of one over n make up in the fre frequency prior. Specifically, if uh, the prior is such that uh, that we know uh, what we know about the data distribution is that there is a large fraction of the distribution. Uh, that is taken up by these rare examples, then tau will be large, so the price will be large uh, for not fitting these examples. And conversely, if there are, if there's, the distribution does not have a long tail, then um, uh, the price will be no, there is no need to necessarily fit this example. It, it, the algorithm can be nearly optimal without fitting the long tail. Uh, sorry, not the, without fitting the, this examples that uh, uh, appear only once that are uh, because there is no long tail. Uh, let me very briefly make just a few general uh, additional points. Uh, so in this result, the model that uh, are out, uh, yeah, okay, no. So this is just um, saying the same thing is that the weight is determined by the weight of the, this, this frequency is on the order of one over n. This is just a formal way to state it. The tau, that's what it determined. And in particular, for zip distribution, I should say we know that this weight will be high. So for, for the prototypical uh, long tail distribution, we'll have a, a the sort of the tau, the price you pay for not fitting is high. Uh, so just uh, let me go to these two notes. First of all, in this result, the complexity of the class of function that we're dealing with does not play any role. It, there's no dependence on it, which uh, is very different from the classical results where it really is important what um, the complexity is. And also I want to mention that this result is as stated, I stated it for the, for sort of for data sets which are labeled perfectly uh, accurately, but it extends to the setting where the data set is labeled uh, with noise as long as sort of the true label uh, the, the, the observed label is the most likely, uh, uh, is the one which is most likely to be true. So can I ask a question about that? Yes. Um, so uh, does that specific complexity uh, contradict reality potentially because we can't actually learn arbitrarily complex Fs and thus there could be some dependence on our ability to memorize and our ability to generate between our ability to memorize and our ability to generalize. It seemed I, I could be completely misunderstanding this definitely, uh, but what I mean is that uh, it seems like you're saying, well, okay, if you if you don't memorize the sentence uh, example, then you know you have whatever your optimal ability is plus the fact that you didn't memorize this example, but that only would happen if you have an arbitrarily complex F, whereas if you have an F that has to have, have a particular shape, which because of the way we optimize, there's something to that, then there could be a dependency, which is to say, for every element that you memorize, you give up some generalization ability, which is a little bit, which is massive oversimplification, but I guess I... Okay, so for now, maybe, okay, maybe what you uh, think, which somewhat con confusing to you, why uh, complexity doesn't play a role, is because I'm only relating fitting how well you fit the data set to uh, uh, to the sub, to suboptimality. Now we will we actually I haven't actually related to it to memorization as defined earlier, and and that was really the goal of the next uh, slide. Uh, I hope it will clarify. If not, feel free to ask the question uh, to clarify your question. I guess okay. So. Uh, let me so if you remember uh, we have defined memorization as the difference in the classification accuracy of an example between uh, the case when the example is included in the data set and the case when it is excluded from the data set that's the definition of when what does it mean to memorize the label uh, and it is not hard to see that the expected accuracy of an algorithm on an example that was excluded is equal to the expected true accuracy of the algorithm on the distribution. This means that if the, if the learning problem is sufficiently hard, 
then many examples cannot be classified accurately when they are removed from the data set. Basically, what I'm trying to say now that we only need to memorize when things are sufficiently hard, when there is enough uncertainty in things uh, uh, we don't see. And, and maybe that's what, what you meant. Yes, if, if we were to learn something very simple, we don't need to memorize anything to fit the data. But if it's the problem is sufficiently hard, we cannot predict some of the labels of the training data. And, but we need to fit according to the res, uh, result that I have just explained. So to, when you, if you want to fit the, the training data without being able to predict itself, you actually have to memorize. So, so there is there is an interplay. The complexity does end up playing a role, but it's only here when we go uh, when we uh, relate the memorization to fitting. So yeah, so that's uh, I hope that clarifies. But if not, uh, feel free to ask the question again. All right, I'll assume that it's uh, it has clarified. So uh, and so far. I have mostly uh, been talking about uh, memorization in the dis this discrete domain. And let me just see how much I'm going on that. No, in the interest of time, I'll skip, skip the extension to uh, continuous domains. It's for images, it's more relevant to talk about continuous domains. And, and, and there we just replace points by subpopulations. Uh, and yeah, so uh, I'll skip it in the interest of time. Uh, so uh, now let me uh, uh, describe the empirical results. And the goal of the experiments is to understand which examples are memorized and how the predictions of the model are affected by the memorized examples. Unfortunately, this is not so straightforward. And if you recall our definition of the label memorization, uh, it requires that we train a model uh, without that training example. So we have, because we need to understand how well the model would predict the example when that example is removed. So computing this value on all any examples would require training order n models, which is, of course, computationally infeasible even on uh, simple and small data sets and even whether if you have a huge compute. Uh, to deal with this issue, sort of, uh, we propose in a joint work with Jiuan, we propose using a proxy for memorization value Specifically, instead of memori measuring memorization relative to the entire data set, we look at the expected memorization value relative to a randomly chosen subset of the data set S of some fixed size M. So we define memorization in the same way, but, but, we, but we measure it in expectation of a, of a subs subset of the training data set, uh, which is some smaller and chosen randomly. And basically, instead of losing the entire, we'll use 70%, and those 70% or something like this are chosen randomly. And the cool thing about this proxy is that for M that is not too close to N, M maybe less, I'm like, say, say again, 50% or 70, the number of models we'll need to train to estimate this value is now independent of N. And it only depends on the desired accuracy with which we want to measure the memorization value. Uh, and again, oh, we can train a much smaller number of data set. Uh, it's still not very small. It's still, in some cases, thousands of models. But um, well, that, uh, that's what uh, Google is good at. Um, so let me give you just a bit more uh, details on how we uh, implement this estim estimator. It's uh, actually very simple. We generate many random subsets of the training data set of size M. We train a model on each of those subsets, on each of those uh, subsets of the data set. And then for each training example, we estimate uh, its memorization score as the difference between the average accuracy, this term, the difference between the average accuracy when the data set includes that example and the average accuracy when the data set excludes that examples. And that turns out to be exactly the memory, this, this kind of this um, uh, memorization score that we're looking at. And this falls just from linearity of expectation. Very simple. Uh, so we, uh, we, uh, the number of models we train is typically in, in, the, in the order of thousands. Uh, so it did uh, take 
quite uh, uh, a bit of uh, compute to get, but at least I believe the results we got uh, uh, are very convincing. And let me tell you a bit about those. So here are some examples with large memorization values that are were memorized in the image net. Uh, and specifically, these are chosen from the Bob sled class. And as you can see, they contain mislabeled examples, uh, outliers, and also correctly labeled, but relatively unusual ones. There's some, anyway, you can see some of them are actually bobsleds, other are unrelated, uh, but the ones which are bobsleds are very unusual ones. And for comparison, here are some examples of bobsled with zero memorization score that there don't require any memorization. And as you can see, the, these are fairly clear and typical examples of a bobsled. So this, uh, this kind of shows that uh, whatever we have computed fit, fits very well with intuition. Uh, let me mention that these are not cherry picked. Uh, there is a lot, I, we put a lot of more of those examples on a website. Uh, these are, uh, just one, just one example of, uh, of many, many of, with, of in the similar spirit. So uh, we then show that these memorized examples are useful, overall useful for the for learning. Uh, in the following sense, if you were to remove all examples whose memorization value is larger than some fixed threshold, um, then the resulting model, uh, the, the resulting, uh, if we were to remove this example, uh, the required memorization, then the resulting model would have significantly lower accuracy. So uh, the orange line in this plot shows the accuracy of the model after all the examples with memorization value above the threshold, which is uh, as a function of a threshold. Uh, were removed. Um, and for comparison, we um, have this green line, which shows the accuracy of the model when the same number of completely randomly uh, uh, chosen examples uh, were removed uh, from, from the data set. So to kind of maintain the same number of uh, examples in this case. And as you can see, memorized examples are even more useful than, than randomly chosen examples, even though they this memorized example, a large fraction of them are just outliers. Uh, but still, overall, they're very useful, even more useful than random examples. And um, uh, our long tail, uh, and, and, and basically this thing at the bottom shows what is the fraction uh, that was removed in the, of the example that was removed uh, uh, above this threshold. So uh, our long tail, uh, Theory suggests that the examples are memorized to improve predictions on examples from the same rare subpopulation. And to verify this specific uh, reason for usefulness. I have a question. I'm sure if yes. I understand the plot. What is the memorization value threshold? You saying on so, the left, so for each, not for very each, highly memorized because it seems that. So for each example, we measure uh, its memorization value. How So memorization is not a binary thing, it's, a, it's some value. Of how which measures the, it, yeah. the difference. Yeah, I the, got that, but the, the graph that I think doesn't say what you just said in, in words. No? So yes. So the, so the, the graph, high value memorization is the one with one. Yes. When you remove them, you don't lose anything. You begin to lose when you remove the ones that are only alike, it's likely memorizable. No, I mean, oh, I'm reading the, the plot wrong. No, no. So if you remove uh, the ones, uh, if you oh, so the, the fifth is the, is the vertical. So, so when I remove the ones with the value one, there are relatively few of those, very few of those, uh, which are perfectly require perfectly one. Uh, so as you can see at the bottom plot here, you still there you have almost the entire data set. When when the value is one, which is again almost never exactly one, you have almost the, exactly the data set, and your accuracy doesn't drop much. So this is the, the corresponds. But uh, now let's take, for example, at the value of around 0.6. Uh, if you remove every, every all the value, all the examples for which the memorization value is um, above 0.6, you have about about 80 percent. Uh, is it memorization value is over 1.6. You have about uh, 80 percent of the data set left. This is what this shows. The accuracy. Uh, the orange line shows that your accuracy uh, shows the accuracy for this uh, removal, which now in this case several percent lower than the uh, original data set, and it's like whatever a percent lower than if you were to remove this, the same number of examples randomly. Oh, but if I read this, then right. Mm -hmm. So if I remove everything 
above zero, so the, the highly memorized values above mm -hmm. zero point six percent. Mm -hmm. I'm only losing like I don't know zero point yeah. two yeah. points. Yeah, I'm losing like very yeah. little. So uh, this high memorized this yeah. this example uh, they are very highly memorizable are actually not that useful. So well, it's, yes, it's very, very everything everything is relative. Yeah, it's there. You may uh, think that two percent is not a big deal, uh, but it is what the game where the game is. Uh, it's it's in this particular example. It, if you the, the question is if you want to push your algorithm to do the best it can, you need to do well in the long tail. Yes, it's not it's not going to be fifty percent, but there is one or two percent of the data that are in the long tail that you will be losing. Yes, I, I'm not saying that this is a matter of uh, uh, fifty percent versus uh, eighty. It's just the, the tail. And it could be just a couple of percent, but uh, even half a percent is a huge difference uh, in this game. But it doesn't, you know, okay, I, I take that, but it doesn't seem like if I remove the ones that are really very weird, these outliers that you really have to memorize completely, so things over 0 0.9, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem there's any drop yeah. in performance by just removing yeah. them. You're right. Uh, you're, 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 you're right. Uh, uh, it's not a huge, if you just remove a relatively small fraction, this will be like a 90 you'll still have 98 percent and you only remove the very weird one there it will be you will remove very small number of fraction of example and the drop will be uh, will be tiny uh yes it's it's um but, but I, I see that this these are i mean i see the relationship it's just that you, you what you said it, it looked like it was a much bigger effect that it the no, no, no i i am i'm <laughs> saying is is that um, from my point of view Okay, that it is noticeable, it, the effect is important enough for anybody who wants to be at the top uh, of a benchmark or, uh, or really wants to do the best has to, uh, uh, has to do it. I'm not saying that this is something that, that memorization, uh, without memorizing these things, you cannot learn anything. You can still learn a, a lot of stuff. In fact, uh, the beauty of uh, long tail distributions is that the, it also has a head, which is very heavy. Uh, so you can actually learn a lot uh, from just fitting a relatively small number of example. And, and another thing we, we see from experiments that you can gain a lot of accuracy by often like from just a very small number of, of good examples. So, so it, it is, yeah, I'm not trying to say that this is, and in, in fact, yeah, the good thing is that um, these effects are important, but not, but it is still possible to learn without memorizing. And that's, a, that's sort of a good news for privacy and for compression. There's still a lot to be learned. It's just, we, sh we cannot ignore, if you want to be close to optimal, you cannot ignore the tape. That's maybe the message. Another way of saying this is that there's some kind of range of hardness of the examples, and you want to include enough kind of hard examples so that you're kind of pushing the, the learning towards a better performance, which is maybe this 0 0.6 or, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. I mean, things that are not trivial to memorize, to, to learn, not to generalize, but you have to memor memorize a little, and that helps you. Those are better well, than I mean, I mean uh, uh, this mem middle. memorizing 70 is a, a lot of like when you like that 50 percent, it's a quite a bit of memorization. It's 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 kind of a big difference in your ability to predict the, the example. Uh, it's a difference for that example, the difference between 50% accuracy and 100% accuracy. It's a big jump. So even 50% is, is, is obviously requires like increasing the, so, so if you think of it as increasing the model capacity by one for to actually fit, fit the example, 50, in fact, 50, uh, okay, it's a 10 class classification pro problem. So like 10% uh, is, is something you get for free anyway. This is increased from, let's say, yeah, by 50% in accuracy. It's, it's still non, non trivial amount of memorization. Maybe we should leave it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, of the, of we are questions. getting to the close of the hour. Sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah, let's, let's, let's finish. So we want to uh, explain why this memorization, not just uh, see it, its usefulness. And, and, and for this, there are, we want to measure the influence of memorized examples. And there are various ways to define influence of training examples on the predictions. And in the, the context of our problem, it's, there is a very natural way to measure the influence uh, 
using the following leave one out influence value. For data set S, index I, and an arbitrary example, XY, uh, X, example X labeled by label Y, the influence of a training example I on the accuracy of at this text example XY, X uh, is the difference between the expected accuracy on the model uh, on X when the model is trained on the entire data set S and the expected accuracy on the model when the model is trained with that data uh, example is removed. So, so, so that's kind of just a marginal improvement in the accuracy on, uh, on this X point Y as a result of training example number, uh, number I. As you can see from this definition, computing these influence values for every memorized example is also not computationally feasible. And, but to deal with this, we can use the same trick as we have the, uh, done before. We'll define a proxy that measures the influence relative to a random subset of uh, the data set S. And as before, this proxy can be computed efficiently by comparing the accuracy on random subsets that include the example with the accuracy on random subsets that exclude the training example. And using this approach, we estimate the influences of all memorized training examples on each and every test example. And uh, the upshot of the results that we have uh, 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 measured is that uh, the large, uh, a very large part of the utility of the memorized examples comes from so-called high influence pairs. Basically, these are pairs of examples in which a training example has large influence on just one a single uh, test example and no effect on accuracy of other test examples. This is exactly the effect of memorizing a representative of a rare but useful subpopulation in our model that I've described. And overall, we detect about that about 3% of the examples in the ImageNet test set for which there is a single memorized training example that has large influence on the accuracy at that text example. So 3% is not huge, but it's definitely not true. And, but what I find is much more compelling is actually looking at these high influence pairs. Uh, here are some examples from the ImageNet with the training example on the left and the text example on the right. Uh, and also the, the name of the class, uh, again, and the test and the difference uh, in the accuracy memorized value. Again, in the interest of time, I'll skip. But as you can uh, see, that, again, the left example on the, of the training set is the one that really helps to predict this kind of unusual example of an Ashcan on the right, similarly with Dumbbell. These are, uh, uh, these are all unusual examples of their class, but they're at the same time very similar to each other, which is kind of exactly these kind of rare uh, but useful subpopulations. Here are some more examples from the CIFAR 100. And again, the same, this, we see the same story. Uh, and, and these examples really fit well with the intuition and theory that I've described. So let me, uh, that's uh, all that I want to say. Let me go to conclusions. Uh, to summarize, uh, this work shows that label memorization is necessary for achieving close to optimal generalization whenever the data distribution is long tailed. The need for label memorization explains why we often see this large generalization gap, which kind of which kind of really inspired this work, and also we often see models that interpolate uh, the data. I think it's also worth noting that this result is not specific to deep learning and suggests that memorization is an inherent part of learning more generally from these kind of natural long tail data distributions. If you want to learn more, you can find the theoretical part uh, in the paper listed here that appeared at Stock 2020, uh, the experimental part and the technique for influence, uh, measuring influence and memorization appeared uh, at previous or recent new reps, most recent new reps. Um, and I also, as I mentioned, we also have a website which gives additional examples of memorization and high influence pairs. The website's also, uh, website also allows you to down download all the memorization and influence estimates that we have computed so that you don't have to do experiments. Um, uh, so they can do experiments with these values without having to train thousands of models. Uh, let me also mention a follow-up up work, which I did with um, uh, Mark, uh, Gavin Brown, Mark Vaughn, Adam Smith, and Kunal Tovar. In this work, we addressed the empirical observation that in some cases, deep learning models memorize entire data points, not just labels. And we explain 
theoretically only, why memorization may be necessary for achieving, why such memorization, even memorizing entire data points, uh, might be necessary for achieving close to optimal generalization error. In terms of future work, uh, I think there are that one of the most important uh, problems in learning theory and machine learning more broadly is finding more faithful uh, models of data, which give us better intuition about how to think about uh, learning algorithms. And I believe that modeling of long tail, uh, long tail in the data distribution is crucial for making sure that the model captures natural data distribution. Our work, this work provides some tools, but more needs to be done. And uh, another important direction for future work is understanding the implication of these results for settings where memorization is restricted by, for some reason, we cannot, models cannot be, uh, cannot memorize, for example, differentially private learning, which limits memorization, uh, or model compression, which limits the capacity of the model. It has been observed empirically that limiting memorization has different effect on subgroups with different frequencies, for example. And our model ex explains why this happens, but still, we still need to understand how to best address uh, these effects. And finally, I think that estimators of memorization and influence that we give will have other applications. There are actually already there are some works that build uh, on those, but I think uh, there is still a lot to be explored there. Um, that's it uh, that I have. Thank you very much. And please let me know if you have any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I guess I, I just have one question from the NLP point of view. We have a long tail, and uh, from the beginning, we focused on the you know head by focusing on the head of our distribution. We already got systems to work at maybe 90 percent, 80 percent. Now we are trying to get the last 10 percent or maybe 5 percent. Uh, so often the solution is just build bigger models. So, what's your opinion about? That now that the trend seems to be just big, you know, build bigger transformer models. Maybe we started from six layers now, 20, 12 layers, 24 layers. So the models are getting bigger and bigger. So do you have, uh, do you think the models are just memorizing? And is this uh, a good way for NLP? Uh, uh, thank you, Gigi, for the, for the question. So uh, it is true that uh, solution. Uh, one solution to having long tail is just having more data and if, and also bigger models that can kind of cope with uh, with more data uh, and, and really more data is maybe uh, maybe the key uh, but at the same time the, the the sort of these the long tail the the data distribution that we observe in some to some degree does depend on the representation that we're using and there is representation we're able to extract from the data so if in, in, in what I what I mean by this that in some low level representation, very low level representation, you can have effectively many more subpopulations uh, as opposed to higher level representations where things are you do see the commonality between them and you can inf uh, do better inference. And in a way we can think of okay our, um, as, a, as a prime example, our brains are presumably very good at extra extracting high level, uh, representation, representation and not memorizing anywhere as much as, as, as models. So, so representation and our ability to extract structure uh, plays a very important role. So in, in a way, we, in addition to, of course, the, in, having more data will always help, but uh, better models uh, are also important. And then there are also algorithmic uh, understanding of just the fact that that we know that the data distribution has a certain, uh, it has long tail. Uh, sometimes it means that one can sort of uh, build algorithms with this understanding, for example, by making sure that different uh, regularization parameters are used for different frequencies of, uh, of the distribution and, 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 and so on and so forth. There are other, uh, once you uh, realize that, yeah, this nature, there are things that could be done maybe uh, to improve learning uh, uh, kind of that, 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 yeah, make use of this uh, understanding. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question? Or... Okay, so let's thank uh, Vitaly for this amazing talk. And I was just wondering. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, we sorry. have a question. Um, 
So regarding the evaluation of um, uh, like that is based on uh, vanilla accuracy, I was just wondering since we are talking about long tail uh, distributions, whether like we can get better insights by using other metrics that take uh, into account the imbalances uh, to see how well, uh, I mean, memorization, enforcing memorization for long tail helps or not. Uh, so I, um, maybe I, I'm not sure I entirely uh, understood the question, but yes, the effects, we know we actually, there are already works that show that, me, that limiting memorization will have a kind of a bigger relative effect on uh, classes or subgroups, uh, subsets of data that are smaller. For example, if your data consists, um, happens to have two subpopulations with very like one sort of uh, kind of a big majority and the other is some kind of uh, small minority. If you enforce the, if you make, if you limit memorization, the relative effect, the relative drop. So we know that that will uh, decrease the accuracy often, but the relative uh, drop in the small subpopulation will be more significant than um, in the large subpopulation because the relative the the small in the smaller subpopulation you end up relying more on memorization because you have less data. The less data you have, the sort of the bigger part of the distribution has this frequency on the order of one one over n which really depends, that, that part of the learning really depends on memorization, requires memorization. Hope that, uh, hope yeah. that answers your question somewhat. Because I, I was looking, um, I remember the, the plots of uh, the accuracy plots uh, versus like the memorization value threshold. And mm -hmm. I was wondering like, because um, it seems that in current literature, I don't know which, what kind of metrics are used. Um, it seems that accuracy is like, used more. So I was just wondering if uh, changing the matrix, like to take in, into account the imbalances in the data would uh, give better insights. But uh, maybe you have shown later on, you have shown in the experimental analysis somewhere how like uh, the accuracy on the long tail specifically, um, how it helps, uh, how it helps to see how memorization helps the long tail specifically. But, yeah. I I I wasn't sure I wasn't sure if there's uh if uh, yeah. Oh, that's I, fine. I, I don't okay. yeah I yeah I don't I maybe I, I missed the question part in in the in your was it a comment mostly? Uh, yeah. If you go back to the to the plot on the accuracy. This this one uh, this one. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is a function as a function of, of memorization threshold. We don't specifically look at um, we don't specifically look uh, at the frequencies uh, of the classes in this case. It's just different memorization values uh, means that there are more examples of this with this memorization values. So when we remove more of them, we we have a bigger drop. Uh, the, the, if we were to create the same plot uh, for uh, uh, for maybe just a small subset with a low, a low, low frequency class, we uh, would potentially see a bigger drop in this, uh, like a relatively bigger drop. We would start with a lower frequency, but it would uh, decrease even more uh, for low frequency because yeah, all of these graphs kind of depends depend on the in, on the weight of the this certain part of the tail, not the entire tail, but only that part of the tail which is on the order of frequencies on the order of one over n. So the the smaller the n, the if you have typically that part of the distribution has a higher relative weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we have a couple more questions. Uh, I think Ron raised the hand first, so Ron, please yeah. unmute and ask. Yeah, I, I, I now I forget what inspired this question, but uh, the uh, so the it seems like you're dealing with all the learning 
as the same, right? You're kind of agnostic of the learning, learning algorithm. And also you don't really care about the kind of data that you're learning, but at least in terms of language data, we know that different kinds of language, uh, different kinds of data require very different amounts of memorization. I mean, at, at, at very extreme stuff like word meanings, it's almost complete, almost all is memorized. Yes, there are some generalizations, some regularities, some guesses, but a lot of it is just, you know, uh, is memorized. Whereas other parts, think of, you know, syntax parsing, or I don't know, where there's a lot less that's memorized, mm -hmm. not completely. And, and we also see the same things uh, with the human brain. Uh, so for example, people talk about the human's ability to, you know, the crit critical period to learn language and how it's very difficult to learn a foreign language, but some parts are not difficult, right? We learn new words throughout our lives and it doesn't seem like our ability is diminished. So I I'm just wondering uh, by looking at, and I don't know what the analogs and vision are. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about the representation uh, where you know if you have higher level representation, it may be a bit easier to do generalization. But I'm not really sure uh, what the if there if there is an analog in computer or in human vision. But what is the? I guess my question is: Do these results apply equally to different kinds of learn different data sets that different kinds of data that you're trying to learn? I would like to say that, that yes, uh, the thing is that the results are the results that I described are indeed very general. The, but the, the sort of the usefulness of memorization, we give I give quantitative bounds on it. And it but the sort of uh, the memorization the useful ends up, if you remember, there was a factor tau. And that factor tau is a function of several things. It depends uh, it depends on um, the number of example, examples you have, but also the number of subpopulations you need to deal with. And then there is also the third factor is the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve. So there are actually three important factors. So let, let's go one by one. So the more examples you have, the less you effectively need to memorize, the more you can kind of extract, you can look further into the tail without having to memorize. I mean, you still need to learn uh, a lot of information, but you don't need to kind of memorize individual examples. You kind of memorize bigger, something more statistical patterns. That's first thing. The more subpopulations is basically effectively the, the to some degree, this is what makes how hard is the problem. If in the syntax problem, you can say that the number of subpopulation, that number of different things you need to deal with is relatively small. So you can uh, capture most of the distributions by just correctly being able to correctly uh, um, uh, predict or uh, solve the, uh, the problem you're looking at at these small number of population. Finally, is the complexity of the problem of the prediction problem you're trying to solve, which is how, how can you relate predictions on different subpopulations? Is the mapping, is, is do you kind of, if you have to eat, deal with each subpopulation set completely separately, like the predictions are completely unrelated, like in some problems, then you effectively have to, you will need to, uh, and you have, at the same time, you have a lot of subpopulations, then you'll have to memorize each and one separately, which maybe corresponds to the problem of the meaning that you have described. But on the other hand, if there is a relatively, there are lots of subpopulation, but the structure is simple, uh, maybe it's all that matters is just like whatever, how the, the ending of the word, that's the only thing you, you care about. In, in this case, um, for some problem, then the problem is simple. And you, again, you don't need to memorize because you can fit well without, uh, uh, yeah, without uh, uh, memorization. So, so there are different, so, so what I, my, my answer is yes, is, is just the, the theory is as described is general. And that's why it, it, for some distribution it made up and end up saying that memorization is not important for some, and for some problems, it might end up saying that memorization is important. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Thanks. I think we have one more question from Harayar. Um, yeah. Harayar, can you unmute and ask yourself? Thank you for the great presentation. 
My question is short. Uh, so have you ever tried to look at how much memorization value is correlated with example subpopulation frequency? Uh, or in the theoretical model you worked with? So uh, kind of came to that, that memorization has to be really correlated with the subpopulation frequency. Uh, so presumably what we are saying is that a memorized ex most memorized examples should be coming from low frequency population. Yeah, that's that's sort of you know, most I would say almost the inverse of the of the of the subpopulation frequency. Right. The yeah, more you have the subpopulation yeah, frequencies, yeah. the less you memorize. It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, Inversely. It, yeah. So in that sense, these are very, very closely related uh, values. So the correlation. Yeah. So can we kind of say that if we plot the histogram <laughs> of memorization values, the but, type of tail we get there will resemble the data distribution tail? Um, the thing is that we don't have the so. Yes, they are closely correlated, but they are still uh, different because one is measured empirically on the data distribution. The other is uh, on, 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 on the specific training set. The other one is in the data distribution. Plus, basically, that's the main difference. One is some kind of empirical measurement, uh, and the other one is defined on the data, distribu data distribution, which we cannot observe. They are closely correlated, but you will see only some, like it won't give you the entire tail. Yeah, you, you, should, you should observe uh some like something like that uh, and there are other things it's it's once it becomes large enough uh, there is a, there is a correlation but i don't think it's uh, that obvious that you will just see the shape it, it's not yeah okay. thank you i think we are out of time um Thank you again, Vitaly, for this amazing talk. Um, Thank you, and everyone. Being, uh, uh, very, uh, yeah, fun, uh, fun uh, audience, and for the great questions, and uh, for uh, again for the invitation. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.